Hello everybody. Welcome to a special program that the Hardwick Gazette and HCTV are jointly doing to bring you interviews of the candidates in Vermont's primary election. The primary this year is August 13th. We'll be interviewing all the candidates in four Senate districts and five House districts that the 11 towns of the Hardwick Gazette are uh, represented by. So, You'll be able to watch these at hctv.us or read them at hardwickgazette.org and each uh, place will be linked to the other. So we'll bring you now interviews of your local candidates. Thanks for watching. Um, well, my background, I, as I was saying, I grew up in Hardwick. I was born here and uh, went to high school here and um, joined the service, moved away, then came back. I have done a lot of things between being in the service. I, I currently live in Newport Town, Newport Center, uh, about 35 miles north in Orleans County. I have uh, raised my children there. I have two children that I've raised independently since they were very, very young. I've been on the school board in Newport Town, the K through eight for 10 years. I've done various things, worked as an engineer at Columbia Forest Products, and a lot of problem solving, a lot of working with people to come up with making the uh, uh, manufacturing more efficient. So I've got a lot of experience with um, groups in town, and when I moved to Newport Center, Senator Starr was living in the town next to mine, and I agreed with everything that he was voting for, though he was in the other party. I'm a uh, moderate Republican. He was a conservative Democrat. And so we um, saw eye to eye on a lot of things. And I always said that if um, Senator Bobby Starr retires, I may just put my hat in to the ring, and here we are. Hi, I'm Samuel Douglas. I uh, was born and raised in the Northeast Kingdom, and I've lived here all my life. My family goes back many generations in Vermont. I uh, currently live in North Troy, right down the street from Bobby Starr, actually. And uh, I'm currently working as a crisis intervention specialist, and I do work with suicide counseling. Um, you know, I'm running because there's a lot of problems in Vermont, the affordability problem, the housing problem. and. I take it personally when I go to town meeting day and I find that there are members of my community that are having to choose between buying heating oil and buying groceries to feed their families. And I take it personally when people that I grew up with, young people like me, have to move out of state because they can't afford to buy a house in the town that they grew up in. Two of my friends, young people, recently just moved to South Carolina because they don't see Vermont as having a future for young people. They don't see um, economic viability for young people in Vermont. And I found that there's a lot of hopelessness. So, you know, I, I think I'm a good candidate for this because I have the patience and the energy and the passion and the love for my community that enables me to go around door to door, no matter how many are slammed in my face, to really try to address those problems and hear from voters what's important. Because not many people are speaking up. There's so many members of our community um, you know, from blue collar, from white collar, from low income to high income that don't use their voice. They don't vote and they don't go to town meeting day anymore. They stay in their homes and their voices are not heard. So that's why I'm running. I want to bring back that voice to our communities and just build a stronger Vermont for all of us, starting from the smallest communities all the way up to the largest across my district. Yeah, thanks so much for the question. And thanks for the opportunity to be here. Deeply grateful to the Gazette and the um, Public Access TV for this opportunity to share a little bit more about our campaign. So I'm Catherine Sims, and I live in Craftsbury with my husband and my two young boys. And for the last two decades, I've worked collaboratively to bring people together to implement creative solutions to some of the biggest challenges in our region. I founded Green Mountain Farm to School, which builds school gardens and educates kids about healthy food choices, and created new markets for farmers by delivering local food to schools. 
as a mom, I worked with other families to create a child care center to increase access to child care and lower costs for families. And as a grassroots organizer, I worked with 27 towns across the Northeast Kingdom to create uh, NEK broadband to bring high-speed internet to our underserved region. And through all of that work, I learned that when we come together, we can do big things to positively affect our community. I also had an opportunity to see firsthand how our rural regions are too often underserved by state policies and um, you know, decided that I wanted to have a seat at the table where rural communities are often um, not heard uh, to affect positive change for our region. So when Sam Young told me that he wasn't gonna run for reelection for the state house and encouraged me to run for the seat, I jumped at the opportunity um, to have a seat at the table. I just finished my second term as a state rep. Um, this last session I served on House Ways and Means, one of the two money committees, and I was one of the co-chairs of the Rural Caucus, which is a bipartisan coalition of over 50 members from the House and the Senate working to advocate for rural communities. And um, you know, over the last four years, it, I've worked hard to get things done for families, working Vermonters, and small businesses. I'm an independent voice down there. Um, I uh, speak up and support policies that are good for our region, and I'm not afraid to vote no when things aren't in our best interest. It's been an honor to serve, and now I'm running for the Senate so that um, I can do even more for our community. Um, I believe I have the experience, the relationships, and the proven track record necessary to be effective on day one. And I will continue to lead on the issues that matter most to our community, uh, affordability, um, housing, and economic development for rural Vermont. Well, this is a very good question. Um, as being on the school board for, again, 10 years, um, saw a lot of mandates coming uh, bound from the federal government as well as the state and no way to pay for those mandates. I, I strongly believe that there's room to, with school budgets, there's room to look to see, we've become very top heavy in our school systems. The supervisory unions are now having multiple levels of superintendents where do we really need that? You know, instead of just uh, coming up with a budget, throwing numbers at it, and then, um, okay, now we have to raise this money. We need to really look at where we are with the school. Ultimately, the primary goal is that a fair and equal education for all the students. But some of those students are currently in one-on-one -on -one programs, uh, students with special needs. There's a lot lost in one-on-one uh, -on -one programs if the student is not able to interact with other students. There's a lot of, um, a lot of learning that can go on there. So I think that by looking at the school budgets, looking at our needs, looking at what we uh, need to provide for everyone, to, again, to have a fair and equitable education, we um, just have to do our best to be fair to all the taxpayers. And I would like to um, take the property tax or the education tax away from the property tax. That would be a great solution to, um, to come up with. I don't have any answers for that, though. Something good to look at. Obviously, education funding is very complicated. There's a joke that in the state house, there's only three to five legislators who even understand how it works. I've heard that joke in multiple different forms at every single meeting I went to when it came to the school budgets this year. Everybody tells that joke. And I know that Phil Scott had a lot of uh, solutions that he was looking towards when it comes to restructuring the way that we uh, uh, fund education. And I know that one proposal that's been particular, excuse me, particularly popular ac um, across the country, and you know, of course from the Republican circles I think mostly, is you know, more school choice, allowing the, fun the funding to go um, with the student where they choose to go to school instead of just having it be um, brought from straight to the schools from the statewide level. Um, Vermonters are clearly up in arms about this issue. You know, the school budget meetings that I went to, there were in some cases hundreds and hundreds of, of Vermonters turning out for that because they feel so strongly that they're not getting the quality of education that they feel that their money should be getting them. You know, we, I think at this point we spend, we're either number one or number two on state spending uh, across the country per student. 
And a lot of other states that spend way less than we do have much better testing scores that you know seem to have a much more educated populace. And of course, I'm very interested in making sure that our students are educated. And I find that there are a lot of schools that manage to do that with a lot less money. Um, and I think it's going to take a lot of a lot of work in, in finding innovative ways to lower budgets, to reduce the spending that comes out of the taxpayer dollars. And uh, you know, I think we're gonna, we're gonna have to get innovative about it. Um, not to mention, the one thing that I hear from teachers all over the place that I interview, and I've interviewed around about three dozen teachers right now, is that there's a lot of mandates and a lot of regulations coming down from the state, uh, of which they haven't been very specific, but a lot of regulations coming down from the statewide level that, um, Oh, that uh, that make it more expensive to run our schools. So as a part of this campaign, I have been out knocking on doors, attending meetings, reaching out to key thought leaders in our region. And I keep hearing the same things, um, same themes. And they're ones that I experience in my own life that I love this community. We live in a special place. And yet, at the same time, it feels like it's getting harder and harder to make ends meet, and folks are worried about the future. And those are the voices and values that I carry with me um, this past session in, in Montpelier. And that meant when um, we were looking at the yield bill and a double-digit property tax increase to fund um, schools, I voted no um, to pass the bill, and I voted no on the override, because I know that while our schools need support, Vermonters can't handle double-digit property tax increases. We need to move forward in a way that ensures high quality education for every child at a price that Vermonters can afford. And so that's going to be the big work of the next several years. We need to implement cost containment measures, um, move towards a simpler, easier to understand formula and ensure that there's equity. Right now, we have some schools spending over $20,000 per pupil on one end of the spectrum, and at the other end, some schools are only spending $10,000 per pupil, and we need to deal with both of those ends. We need to ensure that we're spending um, a fair and affordable amount um, that's consistent across our communities. And I'm you know, confident that the Future of Education Commission that we put together this last session, which has key stakeholders but is also required to go through a robust public engagement process where they're holding in-person meetings in every single county, they're producing a draft report that the public will have an opportunity to weigh in, will help us identify the key solutions um, to meet this objective of ensuring high quality education at a price we can afford. And at this moment, all options need to be on the table. But I trust that Vermonters, the wisdom in the room, can figure out this um, solution. I will continue to be an advocate for our community uh, during this discussion. Well, affordable housing is, is one thing where we have, and it's something that I had just learned in uh, Burke, uh, where there's kingdom trails, the um, bicycle trails over network over there, the skiing area. And I had just learned that there's companies, large companies coming in and looking at the real estate guides and buying five or six houses, picking them out, and they're suddenly off the market. These aren't houses that are gonna be opened up for apartments, they're for um, short-term rentals, Airbnb or uh, vacation rentals or what have you. Um, I think that we need to curb that somehow in the legislative body. Do we, um, how can we restrict companies from buying multiple houses off, the, taking them off the market? As far as other uh, affordable housing, do we have existing buildings in town that are vacant, that maybe they had a manufacturing use, maybe there was something else? Can we convert you know, those buildings into one room or one, apart or one bedroom apartments, two bedroom apartments, multi-housing? Uh, don't know, again, as far as the, what the developers can do for as far as, afford as far as affordability is concerned, there's a lot of you know, everything costs more these days. And how, what's an affordable apartment for someone right now? That's a good question. So there's a lot to, I don't have all the answers for that. Sure, so in my conversations with developers, I found that there is a solution to affordable housing. And, and I'll put a pin in the Act 250 uh, issue for a second, in that there is affordable housing, it's just uh, when you, 
when the state steps in and there's a lot of regulations around how a house should be built and the environmental regulations regarding that, uh, it tends to drive up the prices to build a new home. And when uh, I talk to developers and I hear that they can build a home, a starter home that's affordable, that has excellent you know, energy standards and efficiency standards, and they can build that for 70,000 to 100,000, that seems right there, that that's affordable housing. But then they tell me with state regulations, that number goes significantly higher in cases, in a lot of cases it doubles. That's not affordable housing. So it's, it, we do have some solutions to affordable housing, it's just that it seems like there's a lot of state regulations getting in the way of that. Um, and these homes are not poor on environmental standards. These are built to high modern standards. It's just not as high as the state wants them to be. And the Act 250 situation, um, you know, myself and many other people that I've spoken to, developers, realtors, people that deal with the housing situation all the time, they're in favor of repealing Act 250, or at least putting in significant reforms to that, and that was something that Phil Scott wanted to do as well, and that's something that I'm def definitely interested in doing, either repealing or reforming. Um, and not, that's not to say that we don't need um, regulations and standards for, for our environment, for our, our beautiful landscapes. We definitely do. We want Vermont to stay beautiful, but at the same time, we can't be too restrictive because that's not a place that young people want to move to. When I hear from people that, you know, they've been struggling to get the Act 250 permitting through for months, sometimes years, how does that give confidence to a young person wanting to come to Vermont and build a home? Or that of that, or a young person that's come here and is now renting and is thinking about buy, or building a home? That doesn't give much confidence, and it doesn't give much confidence to me as a young person trying to come in and trying to afford a home. My wife and I have been trying to afford a home for upwards of six years now, and you know we're still in a situation where we have to rent, and so many young people are with us. Vermont is absolutely in the middle of a housing crisis. There are not enough units, rental or you know, um, primary residences available, and it's um, creating uh, challenges across the system. Um, you know, we're trying to recruit and retain families and a workforce, and without enough housing, um, you know, we're we're really limiting our ability to, to move forward. And I'm proud of the work that I've done over the last four years to be a leader on this issue, as the co-chair of the Rural Caucus. Um, I fought hard to make sure that our investments and our regulatory reform that we've done over the last several years to address our housing crisis really include solutions that are tailored to the unique challenges of our rural communities. So we were able to invest significant dollars from um, our federal ARPA dollars uh, into housing investments. Um, you know, not only continuing to invest in our nonprofit housing partners, which play a critical role in our region, but also standing up new programs like VHIP, the Vermont Housing Improvement Program and a missing middle income revolving loan fund that um, helped provide incentives to private developers who can often build um, cheaper and faster and more effectively to get more units back online and to build new housing. But it's not just about investments. Regulatory reform, I think, is a really important part of how we tackle the housing crisis. Um, I helped lead the charge on um, Act 250 reforms to make it easier to build housing in our villages and our downtowns where it's smart and sustainable and fought hard to make sure that we were doing that in a way that didn't jeopardize our rural working landscape and didn't set the bar so high that our communities didn't have a path forward. So moving forward, um, communities across the Northeast Kingdom will have less red tape, less barriers limiting the development of new housing. And I will continue to be at the table to make sure that we're um, building the units we need to attract and retain families and make housing more affordable in Vermont. Why, why, are, why do we have homeless, why are there people homeless in Vermont? What is the, what is the root cause of that? Is there, is it because through COVID they lost their apartments, they've lost jobs, they can no longer afford uh, their living uh, accommodations? Um, we do obviously need to do more, and again, where do we put people that are homeless in short-term living situations? Where do we have, I know the governor was working on some mobile homes or small homes, tiny homes, where they were gonna have, um, I think they were around, gonna cost $100,000 in a small gathering where someone would rent to own, they would have their own house in a matter of, and again, I don't know how many years that program was, but that's what we need to offer folks in where they can rent, rent to own. 
if that's possible. Uh, rent is very expensive from what I understand. Um, so I guess that would be an avenue. Is a rent to own agreement between a someone, a tenant and a landlord. So I work in crisis intervention, and we see a lot of um, a lot of individuals experiencing homelessness coming into our facility. And some of those people are coming from out of state. And you know, when talking to them, I hear that they've come up because they know Vermont is very um, very generous with its uh, with its programs and you know and a lot of the welfare programs that we have. So I want to ensure that you know we're solving Vermont's homelessness, not the homelessness of New England, but. Something else that Vermont could be definitely doing is um, making sure that people don't enter homelessness from Vermont initially. And a lot of that comes from, uh, comes from their backgrounds and their childhoods. A lot of young people uh, coming from more disenfranchised communities or poor communities, um, they tend to not see much option in um, having an apartment or having a home. Of course, finding solutions to the housing crisis is going to help with this. But it's also, uh, if we're going to spend state money I don't see an issue with funding programs that incentivize young people to get training and skills and uh, finding the means for themselves through their own self-determination to be able to have gainful employment and to be able to find a rental property to rent or a home to purchase once they're able to save up. So, you know, I think there is a lot that the state could be doing and I think a lot of it starts at, you know, the younger, younger generation, making sure that they don't enter uh, homelessness from the get-go. So, um, you know, unfortunately, uh, over the last several years, Vermont has had, um, you know, the distinction of one of the highest homeless populations per capita across the country. And, you know, we have a responsibility to make sure that we're caring for everyone in our community and that folks um, are housed and meeting those basic needs are critical to building a thriving community. Um, and yet, unfortunately, uh, and so, so we were able to stand up the motel program to ensure during COVID everyone was housed. Um, initially, we were using federal dollars to pay for that, and when those ran out, we had to turn to state dollars to continue um, housing folks. And um, you know that has been expensive. I think it's been important to have that um, option available so that we're not you know giving folks tents and asking them to um, camp in our parks and on the side of the street. Um, and yet, we need to find more cost-effective solutions to addressing this. And for me, that often really begins with looking at some of the root causes that lead to homelessness, whether it's mental health or substance use disorder. And I'm you know, proud of the work that we've done over the last several years to use opiate settlement money to um, invest in um, expanding substance use disorder treatment and recovery, um, expand our recovery housing. Um, so that uh, we're kind of breaking some of these cycles. Um, and, uh, you know, th these are big challenges, uh, but everyone deserves to be safe in our communities and everyone deserves uh, housing. And, um, you know, confident that we can continue to tackle this in a way that addresses the long-term challenges that we face. Well, it's already, they're starting to fill that. I have a, personally have a plug-in hybrid vehicle and, um, I am paying more in the registration than someone with just a straight gasoline car. So I believe the Department of Motor Vehicles had come up with their calculation that and someone that has a straight electric vehicle, then they're going to pay, you know, two to three times what a normal registration would be. In the uh, field that I work in, we have propane powered trucks. And the registration for the propane powered trucks are almost two thirds again as much as a regular re uh, registration for a diesel vehicle. Uh, I think that where we try to push folks to go to be more um, to save on save on gasoline, save on fuel, and save on the emissions, and now we're. It's, it's not a penalty because they were paying that before in the federal excise tax. Um, so I, it, it's, it's just going to, I don't know how it's going to evolve, but I know that there are steps being made to take care of that. So when it comes to government, I'm a fundamentalist. I believe that we form governments um, for the purpose of providing public services. Those includes roads, militaries, border security. And 
if we are going to spend taxpayer dollars, we need to be spending on our necessities first. And that includes our roads, that includes our infrastructure, and that includes uh, flood mitigation um, infrastructure. So, you know, I'm certainly in favor of, of funding the, that infrastructure from the statewide level to ensure that communities that have um, high, you know, that, have, that are in floodplains, that have high um, history of flooding. We've been seeing a lot of flooding recently, and I want to make sure that those communities can have the proper infrastructure that they deserve. And part of that is being proactive, not reactive. Um, we talk a lot about the, the flooding situation directly after it happens, and then it kind of peters off, and it's kind of, you know, really, really only at the statewide level, but we need to be keeping our legislators accountable and making sure that they remember that the flooding exists not just during a flooding event, it exists um, all throughout the year, and we should be more proactive about it. And that involves um, making sure that we're having uh, proper uh, canalway, waterway, and river maintenance, whether that's dredging or other, or removing debris. Um, and that's also building um, stronger culverts and ditches. That's making sure that our roads have proper, uh, proper and routine maintenance and also proper um, foundations for the roads. And now I'm not, a, I'm not a, a road expert or an infrastructure expert. And that's why I think it's also very important to make sure that the people that are, um, that are making decisions on these things in Montpelier are listening to the people that are doing the work that have the expertise in this and not just listening to, you know, to lobbyists or listening to, uh, you know, various posts on Facebook. So that's why, and when I'm determining my opinions on this, I always make sure I go to uh, excavation companies. I go and I talk to road foremen. I talk to the people doing the paving and I try to make sure that I'm well educated on the topic enough and that I can follow what, what they bring to the table because they're the ones doing the work and they're the ones that know how it's done. So I, I think we all know, and unfortunately have had too much recent experience around the vulnerability that we face with our ever increasingly extreme weather, um, with you know a, a flood in July of 2023, and then another flood um, just last month. Um, our communities are vulnerable, and we need to be doing more upfront to increase the resilience, um, so that we are better prepared, less vulnerable, and not caught having to spend um, you know, millions and millions of dollars to repair our infrastructure. And we need to do that in a way that makes sure that we're not leaving any community behind. It's been really important for me um, as a representative of the kingdom to, to fight to make sure that we're standing up solutions that work um, across Vermont, including our small rural communities. I was proud that a bill that I introduced uh, um, got incorporated into S310 that we passed last year, and that was a climate um, resilience and disaster mitigation fund. And so we are standing up a fund that will make um, infrastructure dollars available, prioritizing high poverty rural communities um, for those uh, resiliency dollars, upgrading culverts and roads and thinking about watersheds and river corridor restoration and other mitigation activities that we can do to keep our community safer so that we're spending less money up front to be safer in the long run and saving us all the money that we spend cleaning up from, from weather events now. So um, this absolutely is a top priority and a challenge that our communities face moving forward, and I'll be a strong advocate for our region at the table. Um, and if I have another second, I'll address the, the EV piece of that. That's something my committee has looked at um, in conjunction with house transportation over the last several years that um, you know, we fund investments in um, road, bridge, and um, transportation infrastructure with the gas tax. And as more folks shift away from gasoline fueled cars to EVs, the uh, revenue that's used to make those investments has declined. And um, we've uh, put in place a study committee that is in the process of reporting back to us about alternatives, including um, a maybe mileage-based fee um, for EVs so that all transportation users are um, contributing to the investments in infrastructure that we need to be able to drive where we need to go. But again, we need to be thoughtful about doing that in a way that's not regressive and penalizing rural Vermonters who have to travel long distances for their jobs. So something I'm paying attention to and will continue to track closely. Well, as far as Vermont's concerned, as we know that that's in 2022, abortion became part of the, the right to abortion came, became part of our constitution as far as Vermont is concerned. It's not, um, I believe, personally believe that an abortion is between the woman and look, seeking to have an abortion and her close family or friends or whatever her um, whatever her feeling is. I, I don't believe it's a, and again, it's not something that's part of my election for to the Senate, 
and um, because it's already been resolved in the state of Vermont. I'll be entirely honest, I don't have much of an opinion on this. Um, in the state of Vermont, um, as far as I can tell, abortion is really a non-issue nowadays. Um, it's in our state constitution, and it, it shows, you know, from the results of those, that vote, the vast, vast majority of Vermonters support it. Um, so, you know, I really don't have much of an opinion on this because it seems to be a settled issue. And I find that um, a lot of the times when I'm asked this question, it's, you know, it, it tends to distract away from the crisis, crises that we are seeing right now. Those crises are affordability, the fact that Vermonters are leaving the state and they don't feel any hope for Vermont, that people can't afford to find a home or that when they can afford to, the homes are far and few between. And the fact that we have had an explosion of crime in the Northeast Kingdom. We've had un just every single day when I go on Facebook, every single day when I open up the news or the newspaper, I'm seeing another robbery. I'm seeing another drug bust. There was a, there was a, a significant drug bust in, uh, in Troy just a couple days ago. And there's drug rings, there's drug trafficking, human trafficking, there's issues coming over the northern border. And I'm very empathetic towards women's issues and women's health. And, you know, and I want Vermonters to use their constitutional rights through abortion because that's their constitutional right and I'm a candidate of law and order. Um, but I, I want to make sure that uh, the, the main issues, especially in, in this campaign, in this race, and in the state of Vermont, this election cycle, are not being distracted from. And, and those issues are extraordinarily important, and they're affecting every single Vermonter and every single person in the states around us. Um, thanks for that question. This is something that I take really personally, and um, you know, I, I believe all women should be able to make their own decisions about their bodies. I don't think um, the decision to when and whether to have a family or to seek an abortion um, is something that a politician should be weighing in at all. I think those are deeply personal decisions that should be made around kitchen tables and um, in consultation with medical providers, family, loved ones, and, and religious leaders. Um, you know, reproductive rights um, are under attack across the country. And I was proud to be able to um, vote for Proposition 5, the Reproductive Liberty Amendment, which was then ratified by um, voters, which enshrines in the Vermont Constitution um, the right for people to make their own decisions about their own bodies. Um, and I will continue to lead on this issue and ensure that um, we're expanding access to women's health care uh, and that women can continue to make uh, their own choices about their own bodies and their uh, reproductive rights. Yes. Um, in Montpelier, in our current legislative body, the current sitting supermajority has the tendency to put a program in place before they figured out how to pay for it. And that is the wrong way to do it. Um, take, for example, the quote unquote Affordable Heat Act that the supermajority called. It's another, it's a carbon tax. It's a horse of another color. When the first one got voted down, they brought it back again. It's, um, and then, then they called it the Affordable Heat Act. And if someone hadn't been following politics, they'd say, oh, the Affordable Heat Act. That must be a good thing. I'm going to vote for that. And this, when Julie Moore, Secretary of the Agency of Natural Resources, came up with uh, figures, again, the supermajority had never put a price on this Affordable Heat Act. Nowhere in any of their narrative was there a cost in how much that was going to be. Julie Moore came up with a very, on her napkin, figured out she thought 70 cents per gallon is what the fee would be the, um, for this Affordable Heat Act. We learned today, actually yesterday, this fee is going to be $17 billion between now and 2050. And if doing the math based on the 640,000 Vermonters and, and um, people that are the homes for the heating oil, um, that equates to $3.20 per gallon. And this was a study done by the Public Utility Commission. $3.20 per gallon is the fee on top of what the fuel dealer is going to be charging for the fuel oil, the kerosene, or the propane. So I would think that the legislative bodies in Montpelier need 
to have all of that known before it becomes law. So one of the most important things that I've been doing, one of the things, a couple of the things actually, that has been very, very important to me in, in my campaign so far has been the work that I've been doing with dairy farmers and the work that I've been doing with firefighters. Um, when I've been going around to all the different fire departments, I've been hearing, and it's been very surprising, but most of the fire departments I've gone to have either never had a candidate come to speak to them or never had a sitting legislator come to speak to them. And I find that very surprising considering legislators, they're the ones that run run our state, our state laws. And why are they not visiting some of the most basic fundamental public services that we have and hearing about those issues and becoming more educated on them. I'm hearing that our fire departments are not getting a lot of assistance. I'm hearing that they're not getting their voices heard in Montpelier as much as I would, you know, I would certainly like them. Um, and the same goes for our dairy farmers. Um, Bobby Starr, Senator Bobby Starr, he has been a champion for, for dairy farmers for a very, very long time. And as somebody that uh, grew up in, in a dairy community that grew up in and around farms, you know, I'm not seeing a lot, a lot of legislators championing those causes. Vermont, which has for a very long time been a dairy state, we were a you know a sheep state before that, and but as a, as a dairy state where 90% around there of Vermonters uh, consider Vermont dairy to be an integral part of their lives, it seems like there's not a lot of attention put to it. So as a candidate and as a senator, I want to make sure that our dairy farmers are taken care of in the way that Bobby Starr did. And uh, that is definitely in the top of my choices for committees to be put on at the, the Agriculture Committee. Um, Bobby Starr is currently chair of the Agriculture Committee, and I want to make sure that, uh, that somebody from Orleans County, that somebody from the Northeast Kingdom is on there with Bobby being gone. So as, as I've said, I've been spending the last weeks and months, um, you know, boots on the ground, getting to each of the communities in the district to really hear directly from Vermonters about the issues that matter to them most. It's part of what I enjoy about this job is I get to listen deeply and to use that to inform my decisions moving forward. And, you know, I know that this is a purple district where we have a diversity of views. And um, I find that uh, wonderful. I, th I think it's an exciting, I think we do our best work when we all come to the table together. We bring our diverse views and perspectives. They're all valued. They all matter. And we find balanced, common sense solutions to move forward to ensure that every Vermonter has an opportunity to thrive. The big thing that I've been hearing from all of you over the last weeks and months is about affordability and that we need to do more work to lower the cost of living for the average Vermonter. Um, I'm proud of the work that I've done as a state rep to tackle these issues, to lower the cost of child care, to increase um, housing and lower the cost of housing, to lower the cost of health care. And um, those are um, issues I will continue to lead on in the Senate. Um, I will work to tackle our education challenges so that um, we are providing high quality education to all Vermonters at a price that property taxpayers can afford, that we will continue our work to lower the cost of childcare. We will continue to build more housing so that we're lowering the cost of housing. And we'll look at common sense um, tax policies so that we are um, reducing the tax burden for the average Vermonter. We're one of the few states that um, uh, continues to tax Social Security income, and I have advocated and will continue to advocate for exempting Social Security income from taxation as one of the ways that we can reduce the property tax or the, the tax burden that Vermonters face and build a Vermont that's affordable for families to um, live here, raise a family, and, and retire here. And, it's been an honor to serve, and I hope I can count on your support um, in the coming election.